Starting verse 1, we'll read through the chapter. Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment, as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. For just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. If prophecy, according to the proportion of his faith. If service, in his serving. Or he who teaches in his teaching. Or he who exhorts in his exhortation. He who gives with liberality. He who leads with diligence. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. Not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints and practicing hospitality. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Come back to Romans chapter 12, talking about the issue of worship. And we began to look at this definition of what worship is to be and to look like. And it's probably far different than many of us expect. And so essentially what we have here in chapter 12, verses 1 through 2, as referred to before, is this is the lens through which we see everything else that follows. And so we can really then carry this thought expressing to worship through serving others as we move into talking about not only spiritual gifts, but also in verses 9 to the end of the chapter and talking about our relationship to others. The interesting thing is that Paul is going to not only talk about our relationship within the church, but he's going to talk about our relationship to those outside of the church. And so... I want to go back because we've already started to look at chapter 12, verses 3 through 8, and dealing with the issue of giftedness, but we haven't looked at the specific gifts, and we haven't sat and dwelt on what was the focus that Paul had when he gave us this list of gifts, if you will, or even as he addressed this section, we talked about the issue of the community, the body, and that is what I want to look at this morning, the issue of serving one another, because essentially we're talking about spiritual gifts, that's what we're here for. If you notice with me in chapter 12, verse 6, he says, For we have gifts that differ according to the grace given us. Now this term that he uses here in the Greek text, echo, means to possess, to have. But Paul is not talking about gifts as a possession unto ourselves. These gifts are a possession for which we are to use for the sake of other people. Just as true as that God has given us each talents, we are to use those for the benefit of others. Now, prayerfully, as believers, the talents that God has given us, we are to dedicate them to God for His glory, for His honor. We are to use those to bring benefit to others, and I would suggest that we can even use those to bring spiritual benefit to others. So I always appreciate those who are willing to bring their talents on Sunday morning and contribute to this time that we call worship, really the culmination of a week of worshiping God, and I'm always thankful for those who step up and take those things that God has given them and use them for His glory and His honor. But specifically, when we talk about spiritual giftedness, we have to be mindful of the fact that we all have gifts and that we are to use them for the community. And 
the understanding is that these gifts are to be used within the local body of believers to which we belong. Now they can benefit those outside the local body which you are in fellowship with, but they are primarily for those within the body that you fellowship. And essentially we understand that every church, wherever we look, every church is just a manifestation of the body of Christ, localized. And those gifts are meant to be used for the benefit of others, for the edification, for the building up. But I wanted to look at the issue of community because it's interesting some statements that Paul makes in verses 4 and 5, and I think they're so profound. But I was reading on the internet, there's a young brother in his early 20s struggling with the issue of church and our relationship with Jesus Christ and what that should look like. And I thought some of his thoughts were very interesting, and so I, I present them this morning as we begin to walk through this passage. But he talks about this fact, he said, I wanted to challenge the millennials, those of his generation, to fight the narcissism, hubris, and arrogance that are the side effects of social media culture. He goes on to say, my generation refuses to live in true community. Now we love friends, we love community, but I think the real biblical idea of submitting to a community, I think that's completely lost. He goes on to say, we refuse to submit to a community. Community is for the accountability, prayer, and encouragement. And I think our blind spot is that. We want to live on our own island. And if we do live in community, we want to put out the cropped, edited version of ourselves on Facebook and Twitter. Now, that doesn't mean you cannot use Facebook. That's not my point in giving you this quotation. The interesting thing that this day and age we see more and more churches going online. You don't even have to show up to any kind of localized gathering of believers. They run live services. You can sit in your own home. You can watch on the computer. They have worship. They have the message. They have everything. But you don't have to be a part of community. That's not church. That's the world defining church for us. And I go back to the first couple verses, especially verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may approve the will of God. You see, that's the world's idea of what community should look like and church should look like, and that is not the biblical view of church. The point is, is that we are a community, but I would suggest to you we are more than just a community. Notice with me in chapter 12, verses 4 and 5. He says, for just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ. And he finishes this off with, and individually members one of another. We belong to each other. This is more than just community. Because the reality of it is, if we talk about community, I live in a community. I have relationship with my neighbors, sometimes good, sometimes bad. But we have community. But the reality of it is, we're not a body. We're not united in Christ unless they are a believer, and we do not belong to one another. There isn't, if you will, that intimate connection that exists as the church. And as the church, we are body. It's a lot more than just a community. And because we are a body then, God has given each one of us a gift that we are to bring together to this body and manifest it and minister to one another for the edification of one another. And if we're not doing that, then we're not functioning as the church, as God so defines it in the Word of God. We may be functioning with our idea of what church should be like and look like. We might be functioning as what the world thinks church ought to be like and look like, but we're not functioning as God determines His church to look like. So I take you to chapter 12, and Paul starts us off in the first couple verses, the Christian and self. And I talked about the fact that Romans really talks about being right with God. And Paul deals with that issue. The first thing is being right with God. I mean, if we put it in simplistic terminology, that's really what Paul is dealing with, how to get right with God. But the consequence of that is not only are we right with God, once we're right with God, we can be right with others. And not only that, but we can also be right with ourselves. Notice chapter 12, verse 3. For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment as God has allotted a me each a measure of faith. We even now come to a right understanding of self, who we are, what we're about. 
So often we allow the world to define who we are and what we're about, rather than allowing the Word of God to define who we are and what we are about, and what we are supposed to do. And it's interesting how often that takes place in our own lives. So Paul challenges us, what are we supposed to offer to the Lord? We're supposed to offer the entirety of ourself as an act of dedication. Presenting your bodies, as he talks about in chapter 12, verse 1, is not just the physical part. It's the whole of us. And when we look at verse 9, if you will, let love be without hypocrisy. In other words, he's talking about the internal aspect of our life. So when he talks about presenting our bodies to Christ, he's not just talking about the physical part. He's talking about the internal spiritual aspects as well. In other words, he wants the totality of us, but the reason why he used the word body is because that is the physical manifestation within society. Society. When you offer food and drink to your neighbor, you do so through the body. That is the tangible element of our existence. It is the point of contact with the rest of the world around us. But God wants all of us, not just some of us. If we're going to talk about true worship, God wants the whole, not just parts. This is interesting. I was just thinking about this, you know, because... <clears throat> Thinking about the process of sanctification, growth, for some of us, well, for many of us, there's probably sins in our life that are inconveniences to us. They're hindrances to the way our life is functioning, and we would like them to be out of our life, and we would like to rid ourselves of those sins. But oftentimes what happens is when we rid ourselves of those sins, and we ask God to help us do that, but when we rid ourselves of those sins, then that's good enough. We're, we're okay now. I'm, I'm good, God. So often, I think, as believers, we want a lot less than what God wants from us. That's why I think Jesus says, count the cost. You want to follow me? Count the cost. Because if you give me yourself, this is what I want. I want all of you. And I want perfection. That's what God's aiming for. Go back to Romans chapter 8, right? The whole reason why God foreknew us, predestined us, ultimately is to what? To be glorified. To be conformed to the image of His Son. God wants perfection. So often, though, we drag our heels and say, you know what, God, I don't need to be saint. No, I don't need glory. I don't want to be, you know, I don't want to be perfect. I'm not looking for perfection. And we think that that's a nice, humble approach to the Christian life. But God's going, no, 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 that's not what I want. I want all of it. I want all of you, and I want perfection. And so Paul challenges us in this first verse of talking about the issue of worship. What does God want? He wants everything. What are we to avoid? Worldly contamination. This happens all the time. And in replace of that, what are we to achieve? Godly transformation. We are so conformed by the world. So conformed. There's so many ways we drink in the things of the world. And it can come in such subtle ways. I mean, we always think that Satan's going to come frontal attack all the time, right? Like Jesus out in the wilderness and Satan just full-on frontal attack with the temptations. It's not always how he works. He is the father of lies. Read John 8, right? He is the great deceiver. Oftentimes we're looking for him to come through the front door. He's sneaking in the back window of our life. And we're not even cognizant of it. It's interesting, the things that we drink in. You ever watch commercials without listening to them and just see the things that they say? It's interesting, I was watching one commercial and it said, no rules, just right. Is there a problem with that? No rules, just right. You are saying that there is something that is right, but how do you know it's right if there are no rules? If there's no standards, how can you determine something's right or wrong? But see, we see these things on a constant basis. We drink them in. We don't even weigh them. We don't evaluate them. We don't process them and think through them. We take up the world's expressions and the phrases and so on, and we drink this stuff in. Even when it comes to the issue of love. I'm sure we've all had this happen. Verse 9, he says, Let love be without hypocrisy. How many times have you had a, a non-Christian in your life say, to you, You're a Christian. You're supposed to be loving. Absolutely. And should a non-believer be able to judge the fruit of our life? Absolutely, right? Jesus said, no good tree will produce what? Bad fruit. No bad tree will produce good fruit. The world should evaluate our life and look at the fruit of our life. But here's the problem, though. 
The world says you're a Christian and you're supposed to be known by your love. But then what they proceed to do is define love for us. Well, love is this, it does this, it doesn't do that, you don't confront, you don't call sin, you don't do this, do that. Now all of a sudden they are defining us. And for some of us as believers, oftentimes we get put back on our heels like, whoa, 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 whoa. maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong for confronting so-and-so's sin. Maybe I'm wrong for saying that that's wrong, right? So oftentimes it happens to us in our life. But the Word of God defines this for us. Love without hypocrisy. What do we do? We abhor what is evil. We cling to what is good. We have our own beloved president, profess it to be a believer, uses the golden rule to condone what? Sin. And I guarantee you there's believers out there that are going, oh, wait, he's right. He's not right. But see, we take this stuff in. And we don't think about it. We don't process it. Listen to me. If we're not putting ourselves in a position to be transformed mentally by the renewing of our mind, if we're not putting ourselves before the Word of God, if we're not in prayer with God, and if we're not in the Christian community among brothers and sisters being built up and edified and strengthened, guess what? This stuff is going to overtake us and quickly. Paul talks about it in chapter 8, verses 5 through 7. And I remind you of these thoughts. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds to the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. See, we embrace the world's way of doing things. We're walking in hostility towards God. It's like, how can you say you're a believer and yet walk the world's way? It's impossible. It's impossible. But yet we do it. The Christian service, chapter 3, chapter 12, verses 3 and following. We're going to look at the issue of spiritual gifts. Paul talks about the fact that there are two ways in which we have service. The first one is spiritual gifts, and then he's going to talk about just the natural comings and goings of life and the different ways in which we can if you will, serve one another in the body and even outside of the body. But he talks about the issue of grace given in chapter 12, verse 6. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. We talk about the issue of gifts. These are, if you will, these are the manifestations of the grace of God in our life. Grace is that common element that we all share. But here's the beautiful thing. We are distinct. Not one of us is alike. That's awesome, isn't it? That's awesome. There is no way that you can be replaced in the body of Christ. I just pray for everyone in the body of Christ, not just here, but universally, that they would understand just how unique they are in Christ and how irreplaceable they are. You cannot replace them. No matter what generations come and go, we're all unique. And that's the awesome thing about God's idea of unity. We often think unity is uniformity. We all have to be exactly the same, but that's not so. That's not so. Paul says we have this common element that binds us. We all experience the grace of God. It's all His free gift to us. We didn't earn it. We didn't achieve it. And so whatever role we have in the body of Christ, whatever gift we have, it's not so we can exalt ourselves. It is for the benefit of other people. We have to acknowledge the fact that there is a distinction that exists. And I, I love this because when we start talking about the issue of gifts, I give you this thought. When these gifts are utilized, it is then that the living body emerges out of mere community. You see, we're not just a social club. For oftentimes, people in the church, that's what it is. I remember my younger sister, she went to a church years and years ago before she got married. And I went to visit, and it was a social club. It was crazy. This, the, my, the thing that really set it off is we're walking through the parking lot going to service Sunday morning. My brother finds a key in the parking lot, and it's a gold key for a Rolls Royce, and that sort of gave us an indication of where we were attending. But it was interesting because I went to the youth department, and they had their own cafe on the church property, their own cafe. It had a counter. It had food. You could go in after church, order hamburgers, fries, shakes. They had jukebox, pool tables, all of this stuff. But it was a social club, and that's all that it was. It was just hangout. There was no desire for spiritual growth. My sister was there for a while and she finally left because she said, this, this, this has nothing to do with your walk with God. It's just about the social hangout. But see, we're not talking about social hangouts. We're talking about the church. We're talking about body life. It's when you think about your own physical body, right, and we start talking about our limbs and so on, our, our body can exist without all these parts, right? The same thing that goes with the church. 
if one of the parts is missing, then we're not all that we are meant to be. As God has brought us together, this body, we are unique and distinct from other bodies even. And He has gifted us for particular ministries that He wants us to fulfill and to accomplish. The thing is, we need to be searching out God and asking Him, what is it that you would have us do? And I love this statement, the church becomes a church not by tradition in itself, but by the repeated action of the Spirit. You see, it's not just about coming and hanging out on Sunday. Again, we're talking about worship, true worship. It is about serving each other, not just on Sundays, every day of the week. Using our gifts for the benefit of the body and the overall growth. So Paul's going to talk about these gifts that have been given. He's going to give us the illustration about the body life, if you will. Each believer is a living part of Christ's body. Each believer has been given a gift. It's for the building up of the body. It's for the perfecting of the body. And this is what makes us grow in a balanced way. We need everybody. See, if there was all eyes, it would look really weird. Right? If it was all legs, it would look really weird. We need every single part of the body to function. This to me became such a, a great realization and so I was driving with one of my kids yesterday in between sporting events and they asked me the question, Dad, if you could take back the accident, would you do that? Of all the stuff that you feel and as a residual of it, would you take it back? And I said, absolutely not. No, because of the lessons I've learned and I continue to learn. One of the things that I've learned is the uniqueness of the body. How necessary every part is. You get a part taken out from your body, and they remove my spleen, so that my body doesn't function like it should function. I, I can't fight off diseases and other things, and so usually I have to get, you know, vaccinations and stuff like that, things that, so that it would help me to fight off diseases. I can't process my blood the way that I need to, and so when I have blood clots, my body can't get rid of it, so they put me on blood thinners to break those things up. You see, once the body starts falling apart, you start realizing just how important those parts are and how it's important that they're all working together. The problem is so oftentimes we talk about the body of Christ, we have just a few members doing all the pulling and moving and the rest just laying there lifeless. That's not body life. We have the, the, the active few and the passive many. We get the idea of paid positions and roles in the church, and we become very comfortable with that. We have that chasm between the pulpit and the, and the pews, right? I mean, there's this big gap that happens, and you have all those who are paid to do, and then you have those who are sitting out there, and they receive and not realizing that they have a contribution. And oftentimes it's not because they're not willing. It's because they're not released to do that. You have men in ministry who are not releasing people and saying, you know what, you need to go and do. And be willing then, if they step out of lines of Scripture, to come and confront them. It's amazing because one brother was sharing in the Midwest, they had a church service, and they had a brother who showed up Sunday morning, never seen him before. He says, hey, you know, I found your church in the Yellow Pages, I want to come, be a part of fellowship. He says, I just want to share something with the congregation this morning. And they said, sure, come on up. So this brother started to speak, and they said at first everything was great, and then all of a sudden he started sort of deviating away from the truth. And so one of the elders said, I just walked up, and I put my arm around him. I said, brother, you need to stop right there. To me, that's awesome. You see, you have someone who professes to be a believer, they're a, body, a part of the body of Christ. You welcome them in, say you have something to offer, but then you're willing to come alongside of them if they're stepping outside the lines of Scripture and say, hey, got to reel you back in. But see, far too often pastors are saying, you know what, I know how to alleviate the problem. Let's just not let people do. Let's just have these few oversee everything, and therefore we don't have those problems, and we don't have to confront, and we don't have to address issues. But then it's not the body anymore, is it? And it's not God's church anymore. It becomes our church. And it ceases to be body, and it's just a community oftentimes no different than other communities. So Paul says we belong to each other. You've got to understand that. We need to minister to each other and we need each other. We do. We do. I mean, oftentimes we, we, we forget this, especially in the ministry side of things. You, you, you feel like you're doing, 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 but you realize, man, I, I need everybody. I need to be encouraged. 
times I need someone to come alongside and strengthen. But we can't walk alone. We were never meant to walk alone. And it's the amazing thing in how God created us as creatures. We are communal beings. You cannot survive on an island by yourself. You'll go crazy. Right? Just Tom Hanks, right? You start talking to volleyballs. you got to have someone to talk to. Yes? You have to have someone to talk to. That's how God has made us to be. And yet we isolate ourselves and we try to stand alone and we try to fight the battle alone and we try to go through our trials and tribulations alone. God says, that's not how I made you to be. The identification of certain gifts. And I'll walk through these because for some of us here this morning, we may have these gifts. You never know. And I remind you that this list is not exhaustive and there's only four main passages where we have a listing of gifts. First Peter is the shortest one. They're not complete. They're not exhaustive. And you can, if you want to, take all the lists and put them together and make one big list and try to figure out, okay? I can't do that. You can do that, but I can't do that. To me, that's, that's exegetically and hermeneutically improper. But feel free if you want to do that. Go ahead. But oftentimes, I think we confuse things. When we start doing that, we stop looking at the gifts as they are intended within a particular passages. But the first thing that Paul deals with the issue of prophecy, notice with me in verse 6. So we do our function according to our giftedness. He says, if prophecy according to the proportion of his faith. 1 Corinthians 12, 20, he talks about the issue of prophecy. And Paul lists different gifts. And he starts off first, second, third. He says, and God has appointed some in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, administrations, various kinds of tongues. We find that the gift of prophecy was up there, second to apostles. When we look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, 12, and he talks about the issue of gifted individuals, in a passage where he talks about the fact that we are all gifted, he says, and he gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers. Pastors and teachers is one person, one individual, two different functions. They're grammatically bound together. Some would like to say they're not, but they are. So, I am a pastor teacher. God has gifted me for the ministry. There's twofold function that I have. One is to shepherd the flock, to care, to protect, to watch over, and the other is to teach, and that's part of the way how I carry out the pastoral aspect of shepherding the flock. But it is one individual, if you will. For the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. So it's interesting in this passage when he's talking about the issue of gifted people that's not for themselves. I didn't give you this gift for your own benefit, for your own mere possession. And in the church in Corinth, they forgot this, right? They were all haughty about, I can do this and look what I can do and I can speak in tongues. That's what's always amazing to me. Charismatics go there to tout the fact that they can speak in tongues and all this stuff. And, and Paul was shooting that down. He was dealing with that kind of attitude and saying, knock it off. Because the reality of it is, when you read through chapter 12 especially, he says these gifts were given for the common good, for the benefit of the body. That's why you have between chapter 12 and 14, the dear spiritual gifts, you have chapter 13, the chapter on love. And we all go to chapter 13, we get, forget 12 and 14. The whole problem was is they forgot that these gifts were the benefit for everybody else. But again, we find prophets is up there alongside of apostles. And Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 20 highlights the importance of this particular giftedness. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. This is not Old Testament prophets, this is New Testament prophets. How do I know that? Simple. Look at the order. Apostles first, prophets next. So in other words, when we're talking about the foundation of the church in the early stages of the church life, there was a necessity for the apostles and prophets to instruct the body of Christ. They were needed and necessary. What was the function of the prophet? It was distinct, distinct from the teacher in that the prophet received revelation immediately, directly. The teacher is going to teach based on revelation already given, but the prophet was going to give revelation, revelation that was given to him. And oftentimes it would have to do with a particular revelation, if you will. Sometimes it can do with looking to the future and predicting what is going to happen in regards to the church or predicting what's going to happen in regards to an individual. We find this in Acts with Paul and Agabus, right, and prophesies about what's going to come in the future, whether it's famine or whatever else. But uh, at the same time, the prophet also functioned in revealing something that God wanted the church to know, to understand, something that he wanted them to do, and oftentimes it had to do with a particular situation. There was something they needed to know from God and how to function, to act, and to behave. 
Now you can ask the question, do we still have prophets today? Ask me after the message and I'll answer you what I think if they still exist or not. Paul doesn't tell us in Romans 12, so I'm not going to preach that from Romans 12. But nonetheless, this was an important gift for the church. The church needed revelation from God. They needed to know how to live and to function and to be, and therefore that was what the apostles and the prophets did. They instructed the church. The gift of serving, notice with me, in verse 7, if service in his serving. I want you to notice something. Paul's focus on action. It's not just talking about position or possession. It's about function. People ask, well, how do I know what my gift is? Just start doing something, right? Start to serve. Notice verse 7, in sir, is, if it's service in his serving, if he teaches in his teaching, he exhorts in his exhortation over and over, we are being called to action, to function, to do, to minister to one another. So what is the gift of serving? Now it's interesting because this particular term, it's also the root for where we get deacon and deaconess from, if you believe that there are deaconesses from 1 Timothy chapter 2. It's debatable, you can discuss it among yourselves. But we find this term used in other areas in Scripture. We find Timothy and Erastus, they served Paul in Ephesus. I find this interesting. Here's the great Apostle Paul, the man who had abilities and power to do things that no one else could do. He brought someone back to life, and yet he still needed those to minister to him. Paul was served at Jerusalem <coughs> believers. He served them by bringing them monetary gift. Romans chapter 15, verse 25. Anesiphorus served at Ephesus, as Paul reminds Timothy of this fact. You have Anesimus who served Paul while he was in prison, and you have the believers in Hebrews displayed acts of service towards the saints. This term for service can be used generally to describe functions that happen within the body, not necessarily referring to giftedness. Now this is an interesting thought to think about because oftentimes we think, well, I don't have that gift, so then I can't do that. Give you an example, evangelism. Now, some think that when Paul is challenging Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1 to stir, to fan into flame the gift that God has given him, some think that Timothy had the gift of evangelism because of chapter 4, the same letter, verse 5, when he says, do the work of an evangelist. Here's the problem. This is where Greek comes in. If Paul was saying that Timothy had the gift of evangelism, he would have used the article with the term there, and he doesn't. It's an arthritis. In other words, it doesn't have an article. So in English, we translate it an evangelist. In other words, he's not saying, Timothy, you have the gift of evangelist. You need to do, though, that which is by quality of an evangelist. You are still to evangelize. So even if we don't have the gift, say, of giving or of service, we are still supposed to pursue that nonetheless as believers. I remember sitting in an elders meeting one time and an elder said, man, I wish we had more people like so-and-so. He's a missionary out there sharing the gospel with people and we had more people like him. This church would be filled with new believers. And I'm thinking to myself, what are you saying? Right? You don't need more of him because he has the gift of evangelism. You just need you and me and everyone else in this room to be out there sharing the gospel like we're supposed to be doing. So even if we don't have the gift, it doesn't let us off the hook. But in this particular case, when Paul is talking about this gift, I believe that he is looking at something more. We find this term again used in Ephesians chapter 4, talking about the issue of service for the building up of the saints in Christ. Now, I believe that this particular term that he uses here, the way that he does so, and he uses the articular form, but the term that he uses here, he's talking about a, spe a special giftedness, and it could be the root of those who served as deacons or deaconesses, the giftedness to be able to fulfill that function. But whatever it was, it was dealing with, if you will, the physical needs of people can also contribute to the spiritual needs. If you look at the function of a deacon, there was also that spiritual responsibility that existed. It's possible, if you look at Romans chapter 16, we looked at this before, but Phoebe, in 16.1, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, who is a servant, the same root that's used here, so they put an NASB in the margin, or deaconess, who is a servant of the church was at Syncrea, that you receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints, that you help her for whatever matter she may have need of you, for she herself has also been a helper of many, and I myself as well. So it could be very well that she had this gift, if you will, this gift of service, but there are those within the body who have this particular gift of service. 
And I would suggest to you that you would be compelled to do so if you have this gift. One of my kids asked me one time, Dad, if you couldn't preach, what would you do? I don't know. Nothing. <laughs> Shrivel up and die. I, I have no clue what I would do. This is, I, this is all I know, right? This is who I am. This is how God has defined me to be. I can't do anything else. You can take a classroom away from me. I don't have to teach in a school, but I have to preach. Have to preach. So whatever that gift is that God has given you, the more that you get out there and do, you'll find that you can't do anything but that. He also lists the gift of teaching. Now this can pertain to anybody, but he talks about the issue of teaching here, and the teachers at that time, they based their instruction off of the Old Testament and then the traditions of Christ that were passed along by the church. Once the canon is filled and the revelation is done, which I believe, then that is the basis of their instruction. And the, this involves the ability not only to interpret, clarify, but also to expound the Word of God or God's truth. To expound is to explain it by setting forth careful and often elaborate detail. Now, you can have teachers in the body. Now, I'll just tell you, you may have the gift of teaching, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're a pastor or an elder. Elders must be apt to teach. Okay? That's one of the requirements. So they will have the gift of teaching. Pastors, one of their functions is to teach. My responsibility is to teach the body of Christ. Therefore, I was given the gift of teaching. There can be others in the body of Christ who have the gift of teaching. That doesn't necessarily mean they're pastors nor elders. And Paul doesn't qualify if it's just men or women here either. I had one brother we were talking about just, just recently. You know, he was sharing about how he was pastoring a church. And man, it just it went so wrong for him. And he said, I realize I have the gift of teaching, but I just, the shepherding, that's just not me. But he came to understand more clearly his giftedness. He understood I had the gift to teach, but, but the shepherding part, that's just not what God has called me to do. The shepherding aspect is the it's just dealing with the the personal relational part. Teaching is the instruction. The shepherding aspect would be coming alongside, exhorting people into the truth, encouraging, comforting them, strengthening them. Also looking ahead to to troubles that may come. If you see things that are happening within the world around you, the things that, that might be an assault upon the church, then those who have that role of shepherd protecting the flock, you're looking ahead and trying to, if you will, do what you can to equip them to face whatever is coming. But it's that, that more of that personal one-on-one -on -one care. So we can have teachers in the body and they can have that ability to, to study. And I'll just tell you, it's not just about studying because there are people who love to study the Bible. All right? They have such a desire to study and to know, but it goes beyond that. It's the ability to also to interpret, but it's also to be able to clarify and to expound upon it, to teach it. And I'll just tell you, oftentimes what happens too is that you'll take someone who's a teacher in the physical realm, the natural realm, and oftentimes they get stuck doing Sunday school. Well, they're a teacher in a secular school, whatever it is, Christian school, doesn't matter. They're a teacher, so obviously then they should be teaching Sunday school. That's not necessarily so either. Just because you do that in one realm doesn't mean that you have the giftedness to do that in the body of Christ. And just because someone has a passion to study the Word of God doesn't necessarily mean they should be teaching either. <clears throat> the encouraging. This is an interesting one. Verse 8. He who exhorts in his exhortation. Now this term can be used in a lot of different ways. When we look at the issue of purpose of teaching is for instruction, for imparting information to explain. The gift of exhortation then would be the, that, that ministry of coming alongside the giftedness to enable someone to come alongside other believers and help them walk in accordance with the truth of the gospel. There are those in the body of Christ who have been gifted for this. In this particular term, I love it because the first part of the word is para. It is to come alongside of. And that's what is so crucial in this gift. They come alongside other people. Sometimes it's to admonish. Sometimes it's to urge. You got to knock this off and we got to get right. Sometimes it's to come alongside and to comfort, to console. And other times it's to come alongside and to strengthen. But there are people within the body of Christ that are gifted in such a way to be able to do these things. Does this mean that the rest of us shouldn't do this? Absolutely not. We're still called to do this, right? We're all still called to teach, right? We, but we may not have the gift of teaching. As Christian parents, first and foremost, one of the primary responsibilities we have as Christian parents is to do what? Teach our children the Word of God. 
I may not have the gift, but that's still a responsibility. So we still have these functions, but there's still the unique giftedness, if you will. So if teaching provides the guidance for what people ought to do, then encouragement helps them to achieve what they're supposed to do. It is that coming alongside of. And this gift enables a believer to effectively call others to obey and follow God's truth. There's some people, I mean, and I can think back over my life in the church and I've seen people who've had this gift of just coming alongside of others. And, and this is such a delicate gift because you got to know when it's time to admonish and urge and you got to know when it's time to comfort and console and you got to know when it's time to strengthen, right? And that's all just yielding to the working of the Spirit in our lives. But that goes for all of us. Sometimes you see those trying to fulfill us even though they don't have the gift and they're walking around with a sledgehammer just whacking everyone thinking it's always a monish and urge, man. Sometimes you got to come alongside, let them cry on your shoulder for a little bit, right? You got to work through some things before they can get to walking. The gift of giving. Verse 8, he who gives with liberality. Love this. This is the dealing with the issue of giving oneself and resources for the needs of others. Where to do this is the church. Notice with me in verse 13 of chapter 12, contributing to the needs of the saints. This is a general exhortation to all of us. So we are all supposed to be givers. And it should all be with sincerity and genuineness and openness of heart. But there are those in the body of Christ who are gifted for such a thing. And, and you will know these people. I, I don't know that my father would say that, but I think my father has the gift of giving. Seen that just over and over in my life. The man would give you the shirt off his back. And it's, it's interesting to watch my father because it, it drives him nuts if he can't give to somebody. And he thinks of things I wouldn't think about. And, and oftentimes it changes me and I think, man, i got to be a little more thoughtful. Because things he thinks, I mean, he keeps track of who likes what, whose favorite candy is what. When he goes to see his candy, he knows everyone's favorite candy. And he has to do, and he has to give, and he has to put it out there. I mean, it just kills him. And he hates to receive. I'll just tell you that right now. He hates to receive from people. When we do special surprises for him, he's a hard time taking it. He just doesn't like that. He loves to give, but he doesn't like to receive. This is someone who's going to give themselves and their, if you will, their possessions, whatever needs. But Paul adds this on there with liberality. The term means singleness, if you will. So it's with single-mindedness and open-hearted generosity. That's why I just think in Corinthians, right? God loves a cheerful giver. <laughs> For far too often, we're given an opportunity to give and we do so begrudgingly. We bemoan it and gripe about it. Well, we do it, but I don't want to do it. But this is someone who gives with an open heart. They cannot help themselves. They have to give. The believer who gives with proper attitude does not do so for thanks or personal recognition. It's just to glorify God. This is the truth for any ministry. I tell this to guys in ministry you're talking about, and I said, look, if you're looking for thanks, then you're doing it for the wrong reason. It's nice to hear it. It's nice that when you put forth all the labor and the efforts to hear the thanks, but that's not why you do it. That's why you do it. You're serving your own glorification and not God's glorification. And when we serve each other, it's not so that so-and-so would say thank you. That's not the end result. The end result should be God's glorification. Leading. Prahistemi is the word that Paul uses. The interesting thing is this term used in the New Testament is only used of leadership in the home and in the church. It is to stand before. And it is, if you will, to provide for that, that example, if you will. Oftentimes it takes instruction. It is to stand out in front and present, if you will, a pattern for those who are following behind something that they can model. That is what elders do. It's interesting because oftentimes people read the qualification of elders in 1 Timothy 3 and they think, okay, those qualifications are just for elders. No. If you read through even 1 Timothy itself, the rest of Scripture, right, in the New Testament especially, you'll see that all those qualifications are qualifications for everybody. I'll give you the first example. He is to be a one-woman kind of man. You look at the widows in chapter 5, they are to be a one-man kind of woman. 
So they are to be, if you will, they are to prahistami, stand out before in front of, they are to lead, to guide, to be a model for, a pattern for, they are to emulate those things that we are to have in our own lives as well. There are those in the church who are gifted to lead. There would be those people who then, who are elders, who would be given this gift to lead. But that doesn't necessarily mean whoever has the gift of leadership does not mean that they're going to be elders either. Paul doesn't so qualify it or define it, if you will. So basically, he's not describing some office with precision. There are just those in the body who are gifted to lead. And this is what you're always looking for. I tell you, that's what I'm always looking for. I'm looking for men who are leaders. 2 Timothy chapter 2, right? Finding those faithful men you can pour your life into. I mean, we know Colossians, leave no man behind, right? That's essentially, right? We want to present every man complete in Christ. But there are those, those few, those faithful ones that you really want to invest your time and effort in. And that's what you're always looking for in the church. You're looking for those who can lead. Not only that, but he talks about the gift of showing kindness. Now, should we all show kindness? Absolutely, we should all do that. One who has the gift of mercies, if you will, or kindness is one who actively shows sympathy and sensitivity towards those who are in suffering and sorrow. Could be towards the poor, those who are sick, the elderly, widows, whatever it is. I mean, when I think about this, I think about Dorcas, all those spiritual gifts weren't in process at the time, right? But you look at Dorcas in, in Acts and talk about the fact that she did many good deeds and she helped many who were in need. And those widows, right, when she died and they were beseeching Peter to, to raise her back from the dead, right, to do something showing all of these things that she had made for them and that. See, there are those in the body who have this ability to come alongside those who are in a time of sorrow and suffering and they can impart, if you will, mercy to them. But I love how he defines this because notice with me, he says, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. So I give you this thought as he adds this on there. This attitude is crucial to ensure the fact that the gift of mercy becomes a genuine help, not discouraging commiseration with those who are suffering. You see, here's the thing. Sometimes we find those in the body who are suffering and they're in pain and they need someone to come alongside and to show them mercy, but they don't need someone to wallow in their misery with them. In other words, the point is that we are to lift them up. You don't want to stand to stay in this moment of suffering, right? We don't want them to stay in this point of pain and agony and sorrow. We want to uplift them and bring them out of that, right? So it doesn't do us any good to sit there and wallow in the mire with them. But so often, this is what happens. Someone's hurting. We throw our hurts on time. And sometimes try, I, a teacher reminded me of this, you just be careful. Someone's hurting, and some, you may be going through the same hurt, but you have to be careful because sometimes someone's hurting and they're sharing with you, and you start throwing all your hurts on them, and it just becomes a big old pity party with both of you, and no one's lifting anybody up. You see, the one who has this gift of mercy isn't so that they can stay that, in that point of sorrow and suffering, it's to help lift them up out of it. And so therefore, Paul has to add this qualification on there, those who show mercy with cheerfulness. Cheerfulness. We want you to stay there. This is a reminder for all of us because we are also supposed to come alongside and show compassion to one another, show mercy to one another, be there in times of sorrow and suffering, but we don't want each other to stay there. We want to lift out of it, right? So even if you don't have this gift, nonetheless, we still are to function this way as the body. But there are definitely those in the body who have this gift. It's amazing because I can think of those o over time in my life who I would be sure that they have this gift. Thinking through the gift of exhortation. And it's amazing. It, just, it doesn't... This is just an aside. It, it doesn't have to be this formal function, you see? There are certain gifts, prophets, teachers, right? You can't. You have to be up front. You teach, right? And it's the visual aspect. But there's so many gifts in the body that are behind the scenes, the in life, right? And a lot of people don't see them. And you can think, well, I can't do that. And one woman comes to my mind, dear sister in the church. 
she was such an encouragement and I would say she had the gift of exhortation but she couldn't be there for everybody. She prayed and she would write you notes and she'd know when you were struggling. She'd write you notes and say she couldn't get out and drive herself. She couldn't come to your front door. But she could write and do that and encourage you. So many times she had done that in my life in ministry when I needed someone alongside to lift me up, to get those notes from her. But see, it, it doesn't have to be in a formal way. Do you understand? Just know that God has gifted you and the more that you step out and the more that you serve and look for needs and step in and try to meet those needs, you'll discover what your gift is. You'll find like the one brother, I'm not, I don't, can't chip, I'm not a pastor, but I, I teach, that's, that's my gift. You see, the more you get out and do, the more you will come to understand, the more people will affirm that in you. I hated being a front. I hate this. And you all know me. I'm not a socialite. What Jill said took, what, three weeks before I died? I'm, I, I admit that. I'm not a social person. It, it, it's a fight for me not to draw in to myself. I can get lost in my own thoughts and think about things I'm, Tristan takes after me. He doesn't need people. We have to force ourselves to be out there with people. Naturally, this would not be my position for myself. But yet someone asked me to speak and I get up and I speak and the affirmation that came as a result of that was an affirmation of what I thought God was leading me into and all along the way I've, I've seen this happen in my life the affirmation of this is what I have gifted you to do continue to do that I'm so sure of who I am in Christ now what I'm supposed to do there's no doubt and I can't think of anything else I would do just can't but see, you'll never know till you just step out and do. And some think, look, I got to go to a bigger church. I need 100 members, 200 members, 300 members for me to figure it out. I just tell you, that's not where you're going to find it. You can go there, but most often they're going to have their paid staff and their few assistants, and that's it. And, and you'll be lucky if you find places where you can fit in and do. You don't need mass numbers. All you just need is people. There are those in this body who need to experience your giftedness in their life. You have it, no one else can do it, and it's necessary. I mean, gift of teaching, not all teachers are the same. My dad and I are totally different, but yet we both have the same gift. What you can do for this body is what no one else can do for this body. My prayer is that everyone here comes to understand what that is. And that they would do as Paul challenges us to do, to use it, to use it exponentially for the sake of serving other people. He's going to take us, and we're going to look at next week, and Paul's going to lead us into our other relationships, both within the church and without the church. But he's going to talk about the way we can serve others in different ways. But understand this, we've all been given gifts, not for mere possession, but for the sake of building up and edifying the body of Christ. May God help us to understand how He has gifted us, what He wants us to do.